Gospel of John, chapter 15. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. Um, we've come through chapter 14, and uh, we could have said a few more things about uh, the other verses, and we may touch on that a little bit later, but the Lord really led me into chapter 15, and uh, I want to share with you today from my heart. Please um, listen carefully. Uh, the Bible talks about how important it is to hear the Word of God. Uh, John chapter 15, now remember that our Lord is approaching the final days of His life, and uh, the disciples are uh, they, they're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Judas has already gone out from among them, so there's only Jesus and the eleven. And uh, this uh, thing of the true vine and the branches has a lot of history behind it. Verse 1 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. He is the farmer. He's the one who ultimately is in charge of all things. So I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Down through Jewish history, the vine had become the symbol of Israel during the Maccabean period of history. The Maccabean period of history was the time during the Testaments. It was the time when there was no prophets and the Word of God was very scarce. Over the temple was a uh, etched carving of a vine and that vine represented Israel because down through history Israel had been represented as the vine. If you would take your Bible and turn back with me to the book of Isaiah I'd like to read something in your hearing Isaiah chapter 5 and I'd like to read beginning in verse 1 where it talks about Israel as the vine. It says in verse 1 of Isaiah 5, Now will I sing unto my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vines and built it a tower in the midst of it, and also made a winepress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Now the wild grapes were not edible grapes. They were very tart and would cause you to spit them out. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will take away the hedge, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down." Now let me just kind of paraphrase what Isaiah is saying. He tells us here that a man went out and he bought this beautiful property. He invested a lot of money and time. 
He built a wall around the vineyard. He planted the very best vines. He put a tower in the middle so that someone could guard it and watch it at all times. He watered it. He cared for it. But when it came time for fruit, it was wild grapes that could not be used. Now that was a picture of Israel. Israel as a nation had all the blessings of God. They had been cared for. They had been nurtured. The Lord brought them out of Egypt and gave them a great land. But what did they do? They forgot the Lord their God. And they turned back and served the gods of the Amorites and the Canaanites. And they worshiped Baal. And so what did God do? Well, God sent judgment upon the nation. They deserved it. God didn't do anything that they didn't deserve. Just like the man who planted the vineyard and it would not produce, he destroyed it. Same thing God did with Israel. Remember what Jesus said when he uh, walked by the temple? He said, your temple is left to you desolate. That was the last words he spoke to Israel. And in 70 A.D., the Roman Empire sent its troops in and under the leadership of Titus and some of the other men like Antiochus Epiphanes, they came in and they destroyed the country. They took people captive. They murdered people that were, uh, became their, their uh, enemies and they destroyed them and God brought judgment. And so we see that Isaiah prophesied about this happening. I'd like to give you one more. Jeremiah is just one book over. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21. The Bible tells us there in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 21. Yet I have planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed, how then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? For though thou, thou wash thee with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways, which is speaking of a one-humped camel that they rode through the desert. A wild ass used to the wilderness that snuffed up the wind at her pleasure. In her occasion, who can turn her away? All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month, they shall find her. Withhold thy foot from being unshod, and thy throat from thirst. But thou saidest, There is no hope. No, no, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. Now I wish we could read the rest of it, but I hope you do sometime. There again, uh, the prophet Jeremiah says that Israel was just like that vineyard, that vine. I want to tell you something today. There is no nation in this world that will answer your problems. Your answer to your needs in life will not be found in money, will not be found in fame or fortune. Your needs in this life can only be fully satisfied in the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who died, was buried, and raised from the dead. He's the only one that has power to forgive sins. And yet, what does the world do? The world wanders after every new thing that comes available. The world is clamoring after all sorts of things. I don't know if you saw in the paper 
But in Cincinnati, Ohio, yesterday they had a big gay pride. And there was thousands of people in the streets. And they weren't just saying that we're homosexual. They're saying we're homosexual and we're proud of it and you ought to accept it. I say, so what? If you want to be perverted and you want to live a perverted life, then God will take care of you. But why do we need to be out there pushing it in people's faces and saying this is some great way of living? Brother Philip brought this out this morning in his Sunday school lesson that homosexuality is when you get to the bottom of the barrel. It is not a way of life to seek after because if you study what it does, it leads people into the very bottom of the bucket, the dregs of sin. And it's, it's listed with bestiality and, and all sorts of pervertedness. We don't celebrate it because it's sin. Just like we don't say, well, let's form us a group of adulterers and we're going to make adultery accepted throughout the nation. Let's adopt a, a sign or a flag and let's fly that flag and promote adultery. That's exactly what they're doing. They're taking a sin and trying to glorify it. And there are many who are flocking after it. And in the end, many of them will come down with AIDS and different diseases that will destroy their life. Now, do I hate these people? No. No, I love them. In my heart, I love them. And I care about where they spend eternity. But sin is sin. And if we don't seek after the one true vine, our lives will never amount to anything of importance. Before I got saved, I tried about everything you can imagine. I'd have these buddies and they'd say, Oh, smoke this. Oh, take this. Drink this. Do this. And here I was, a little foolish boy, and I would, I would follow right after them. It didn't bring me peace. It didn't bring me hope. It took me down. It made my life worse. And were it not for the grace of God, I'd be dead many years ago. But Christ had mercy upon me, came into my heart and saved me, and now the Spirit of God works in my life so that each day I live, I want my life to be an example. I want to reach someone else. I want to touch someone's life. I want to pray for them. I want to encourage them because He is the true vine. And the Bible says that we are the branches. Now the temple was close to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples, you can just picture this in your mind now. Here's Jesus and the eleven. And they're walking through the Mount of Olives, which had all these beautiful olive trees. No doubt there were different places where vines and grapes were growing. And they would make their, their wine and grape juice and various things from the grapes. And when they stood at the top of the mount, scholars say that they could see the dome of the temple and, and the, the beautiful lights that they had with torches that was a, like a chandelier except it was full of candles and oil lamps. And they could see that vine that was over the top of the temple. It was about 107 feet tall and made from the choicest of marble and it was decorated with solid gold. And maybe Jesus pointed out with His finger and said, Look! Look at that! See that drawing, that carving of the vine? And then He turned to them and He said, I am the true Vine. The true vine means that there is nothing false in him. Jesus never sinned. 
He never committed a falsehood. He was the perfect Son of God. That's why He can be our substitute. You see, I can't be perfect. I can't be without sin. But there was one who could be, and He was. He was the perfect Son of God. And He lived His life 33 and a half years, never sinned. He was spotless and perfect. And then He presented Himself as the Lamb of God in fulfillment of the Scriptures. He died, He was buried, He was resurrected from the grave. And today, today He invites you to come. Come to Me. I'm the true vine. And when you come to me, you will find life just like the woman at the well who was drawing water. And he said to her, Woman, if you drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. For it will be a well of water springing up in you to everlasting life. I can tell you by experience. I know I'm a preacher and I've been a preacher for 40 years. Lord saved me in 1978 and I've been telling people about him ever since but I want to tell you something I found the true vine maybe I should put it this way the Lord who's the true vine found me and he saved me and he changed my life and I've never thirsted and I've never hungered spiritually since that day that he saved me because His grace is sufficient. Isaiah tells us that Israel had failed. Jeremiah tells us that Israel had failed. And if we had time, we could go to Ezekiel chapter 15, verse 1 through 6. Ezekiel drew the same comparison. He said Israel was like the vine dresser who had put out a garden and tried to grow the grapes, but it did not produce. Now here Jesus says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now let me uh, say something. Uh, those of you who, who grow a garden... Um, you know it's hard work to grow a garden. You got to, the, the main thing you got to do after you plant the garden is you got to keep the weeds out. You got to hold the garden. You got to keep the weeds from growing. A father was trying to teach his son a lesson, and he said, "Son, he said, there's our garden, and uh, they had planted their their seeds, and it was growing, but they had not pulled out the weeds." And he said, son, that's exactly the way your life will be. Your life is like a garden. And if you do not keep the weeds out, there will grow these noxious plants that will ruin your life. Whether it be drug addiction, alcoholism, sexual uh, perversions, you see, as a young man or a young woman, you have lust, you have desires, and if you do not have the power of God to control those things for good, these weeds will keep growing. And before you know it, look at the lives of different people who've not taken care of their lives and look at what a wreck they are. Look at their homes and their families. Look at the way they treat each other. Look at the way they, they live their lives. And you can see, I, I was the product of a lost mom and dad. My mom and dad didn't know the Lord, and I grew up as a child being thrown about. My mom and dad splitting up, uh, saying they were going to divorce, and dad would say, go with me, and mom would say, go with me. And I watched them fight and argue and never had peace in our home. I mean, it was just a disaster. And I said when I was about 14, I will never get married because if this is what marriage is, I don't want it. 
But the Lord saved my mom and dad. And I saw what God could do and how He changed their lives to make them love each other and love me and have a real family of, of God reigning and directing in our lives. You see, He is the authentic vine. And it says that we must abide in Him if we're to bear fruit. Notice verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. We must walk closely. He's the vine, we're the branches. We grow out of Him. And as we walk in communion with the Lord and fellowship with the Lord, our life produces fruit. You see, this is such a wonderful blessing. Uh, uh, what does a life of fruit look like? I want you to take your Bible, and I want to point out in the book of Galatians, if you'd turn there, Galatians chapter 5, uh, I want to read uh, what the spiritual life or the light, uh, life of fruit really looks like. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Now, the, the first part of chapter 5 is about the works of the flesh. Here they are. Uh, verse uh, 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Before I got saved, I would say, I'm going to quit cussing. I would say, well, I'm going to quit doing this. But I'd find myself with my old buddies, and they'd start cussing, and there I'd go again. I'm going to quit partying. And then one of my friends called and said, Hey, bud, we're having a big party tonight. Bring your guitar and let's, let's party hardy. We're going to have drinks and drugs and all that stuff. And next thing I know, there I go. I'm right in the midst of it. And I wanted to change, but I couldn't. I tried, but I couldn't change until the Spirit of God saved my soul and I surrendered my life to the true vine. Verse 18, But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Listen to me. Here are the works of the flesh. Adultery. As a seven-year-old boy, I watched my dad go to be with another woman and commit adultery on my mom. I was seven years old. My dad told me, he said, Don't you dare say a word to your mom. But something in my heart really hurt, and I wept. And I said, Dad, why did you do that? Mom is faithful to you. Why would you be unfaithful to her? Fornication. Here's a young man. He's, he's got the desires of a young man, and he's around a young woman, and we all know how the flesh works. And if you don't have Christ and the power of the Spirit in your life, you're going to yield to that flesh and you're going to con commit pornea. You're going to commit fornication. Young people, hear your pastor. You do not have sex until you get married. Keep your body pure. Stay away from sexual immorality because many times what it will do is it will link you with a person. You start a relationship with somebody and you commit pornea and then... You, you're bound together by that sin and it's harder to break away from. A lot of times people end up getting married because a girl gets pregnant and they don't really love each other. It's just because she got pregnant. Fornication, uncleanness. Uncleanness means anything you do that is vile lasciviousness that big word means a lack of control 
You can't control yourself. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If that is the pattern of our life, if that is the habit of our life, it will dominate us and you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22 now, the fruits of the Spirit is love. Isn't that beautiful? You ever know what it really means to love somebody not for what you can get from them, but to just truly love them? To love them unconditionally. That's what agape means. It, it means love that is undeserved. It's perfect love. Love, joy. We want joy, don't we? I want to tell you something, young people. You're not going to get joy by doing drugs. Oh yeah, you'll get a high for a little while, but then you'll come crashing down. It's not going to bring you real joy. It's not going to make you happy. In fact, it's going to make you suicidal. I watched a program on TV the other night, and they were talking about how many young people, even from the ages of 9 and 10 up through their teenage years, are committing suicide at record numbers. And the public school system is saying, what are we doing wrong? Well, let me tell you something. You're not doing very much right. Because when you don't begin with God and give them a foundation to build their lives on, what are they going to build it on? That's why you need Christ in your life. That's why you need His joy to fill you. Peace. It's remarkable what God can do when two people get saved. And instead of arguing and fighting, there's real peace. Humbling ourselves and, and trying to work together, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I wanted to ask some questions, but I think I've answered them. What is the fruit that he's talking about? I don't think that it's going out and winning souls or uh, what you do necessarily. It's a life of faith, believing and trusting God. What is it about the cutting of the branches? I'm going to leave you with this. The keys to fruitfulness is live without deceit. Fear God rather than men. Don't be a people pleaser. Find, you'll find that it'll be a snare. Be, a, be careful with flattery. Walk in humility. Confess your sins quickly and pray continually. When, when a gardener or a, one who tends the vineyard goes out, he would watch the vines. And sometimes the vines on the bottom would get dirty. Listen, I'll close momentarily. They get dirty. And so the gardener goes out and he lifts up the vine and he washes it off and he lays it up on another vine to keep the dirt and the moisture from ruining the plant. Now here it says that if we abide in Him He will purge us. That means He will cut us and, and work in our lives so that we will be more believing and have more faith in Him. Just like that gardener who goes out and tends those vines, the Lord tends His vines. He is the true vine. We are the branches.
If you don't know him today, I'm going to ask you to turn from sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. If you're not saved, trust Him right now. Let's stand together. Brother Phil.